I'd like to say burnout's getting better. I'm not sure it is. There was just something came through on my Medscape uh, thing last night that said um, uh, ten, one in ten docs are thinking about suicide still. It may be down a little bit, but it needs to kind of go less than that. Um, who wants to go first? I think. Oh, it's hot. We'll just wing it. Why don't you go first? Yeah. You go second. I'll go third. Okay. Uh, I've got two options I can do based on how much time we got. I got one that's kind of a cathartic lecture, and one that's kind of, exactly. one that's like how I dealt my own personal burnout. One is more kind of like yeah. uh, general. So, Thanks. well, we may not be able to stay for the longer one, but <laughs> well, that's what you, you notice we dressed up uh, this morning for this one. So, I even wear my Canadian shirt since I got moved to Canada after this lecture. So. <laughs> This was, a, you know, this is tradition. We've been doing burnout for what, five, six years now. Yeah. Right. But <clears throat> it's funny because an article showed up, not just the Medscape one that Clay's referring to, but you know, obviously in the pandemic, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, what's what's making patients nuts, what's making us nuts, and you know, a lot of things that you know didn't drive patients into the office led to screenings that led to more skin cancers, which is interesting. But you know, the the patient waiting times, the the lab results, all all that made them very upset with us, upset with the systems, obviously made wearing masks, actually made diseases worse. And then of course, you know, having to shut the doors of the practice was not easy for everybody. You know, employee safety was tough, everyone was calling sick, had to be out for five days if they were even remotely close to having COVID symptoms. And then, you know, for, for some telemedicine was great, I thought it was a disaster. But uh, it really tested a lot of morale and tempers and, you know, and those who had to work from home or do telemedicine from home. Uh, was was always rough. Emotions were running wild. Weights went wild. I know mine did. And then uh, you can see, you know, substance abuse was also a, a fun thing for doctors to to dive into. But uh, this was an interesting part of it. You know, just looking at, you know, emotional exhaustion. You know, low low self esteem, low accomplishments. You know, not just in physicians but in the staff. And everything you try to do to intervene almost led to quicksand. You know, it was trying to go backwards instead of forwards. So a lot of things you know that we tried to do, you know, may have worked against us. So I don't think I have to tell you what I think causes burnout. I think listening to my lectures is probably all you need to know. Um, as you've heard from me over the years, all the alphabet soup of EHR and everything else, um, that, that is basically death by a thousand cuts. And it's really not exhaustion, right? I mean, all of us were interns. We all, we all saw patients for 80 hours a week during that time. And um, no one was ever burnt out from doing that because why? Because you were actually doing patient care. So it's not a matter of being overworked. It's a matter of being overworked with stuff that doesn't matter. That's what does it. Um, the, the, there's a paper that came out that uh, general surgeons that work in the OR have a lower level of burnout. And the reason is, is because the OR is kind of like a sanctuary where actually everything works the way it's supposed to. Because you don't see a surgeon getting his uh, surgical trace set up. You don't see a, an anesthesiologist calling the, the, the pharmacy to get a prior off on, on the anesthetic, right? Everything actually works the way it's supposed to. And that's why they don't get burnt out, because they have long surgeries, they're exhausted, but they're not burnt out because they're actually doing what they were trained to do. And that is what cures burnout, is to do what you were trained to do. It's, burnout is, is not exhaustion, it's a gradual decay of your soul from prolonged, unmet psychosocial and spiritual needs. And, and Clay will probably get into some of that too. It, it is because you are doing things that you, th that you know are unimportant when you could be doing things that are important. We are the most resilient people in the world. So I, I actually take offense when people tell you that you have to learn to become resilient. How could we have gotten to where we are without being resilient? That's silly. It's not like a, a, it's, it's not a, it's not a skill that we have to learn. We've, we already are resilient. We burn out because we've lost the desire to do this because it's become unsatisfying because you spend your time doing the wrong things. There was the best article I, I read came out in 2020 on physician burnout. It talked about 
um, some concepts from organizational psychology of intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. And intrinsic motivation is pretty easy for most physicians because you did something that is meaningful in the world. You became a physician. So the intrinsic motivation is very high. Then it's up to extrinsic motivation whether or not you're going to burn out. And the extrinsic motivation is the money that you make, but it's also the how your day goes. You know, are you now forced to do this with fewer MAs because of inflation? Are you doing prior auths every day? Is, is your day filled with non-patient care nonsense? Or are you actually just seeing patients and doing what you need to do? And Steve Jobs, you know, said it really well. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. And we're really fortunate to do what we do. As dermatologists, we love what we do. As dermatopathologists, you love what you do. It's, you know, probably the only, the closest thing I've seen to a cure from burnout is this, this week, just a few days ago, I spent three days in Camp Discovery. And for those of you who don't know what Camp Discovery is, it's, it's a philanthropic effort of the AAD that um, sponsors camps, five different campsites across the country, to, to basically give a week to kids who have serious skin disease, who have very low self-esteem because they're judged by the way they look, and they put them in a place where they get to act like kids. They learn, you know, to, that you know there's, that other people have the same skin disease, and that and it was actually one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen, and probably the closest thing that I've seen to burnout. And that's the kind of stuff that you need to be reminded. Unfortunately, we need to frequently be reminded why it is that we do what we do. And a lot of times, the, the stuff that just piles on that keeps us from realizing why we do what we do is what burns us out. So I'm going to hand it back over to Neil. So then earlier this year, this article showed up about getting burned out talking about burnout, which is kind of interesting. So I ran this by Clay and Mark, and I said, you know, this may be the topic we need to take on. Are we, are we, should we be done talking about it? Because the more we talk about it, the more we feel it. And even more so, is the, is the term burnout actually correct? Because the, as it says in the paragraph, it, call it burnout, it's a term borrowed from the slang of substance abusers. So some suggest that you know, we should be more focused on tackling it rather than actually rehashing it. And again, you know, is, it a, is it a burnout? That, uh, sorry, is it a disease that has a coding? Well, ICD-11 has burnout as a syndrome. You know, workplace stress that's not been managed, you know, occupational phenomenon, really, than a simple, you know, medical condition, which is really interesting because in, in many ways, you know, we, we just discussed how the, the psychological and, and the uh, fatigue issues that come from burnout are, are going to lead to other metabolic issues if we're not careful. But in this article, it says, well, we're, I'm tired of hearing about burnout because they want to hear about solutions rather than, again, going beyond what's taking care of ourselves, right? It's not solving the problems. It's not, again, turning off that faucet, like we keep saying. You know, there are systematic factors that contribute to burnout that are, again, inherent. And like Mark said, you know, the issues that go along with bureaucracy and not being able to do our jobs are going are to pile onto that. And this was a family doctor in Green Bay. He was talking about, you know, burnout. Again, they're burned out because they're hearing the solution to burnout is just to become resilient, like Mark said. And again, making meaningful systemic change isn't going to be the answer for everybody, right? So it does start early. When you're up against a lot of walls, especially in, you know, in early stages of medical school, you've got to figure out your your own way of doing things, but at the same time, this, this ability of you know, overcoming toxic stress, it, it's inherent to the, to the process. You know, this study talked about even non-pre-med students don't have the, the issues that pre-med students do because of the, you know, the, the waiting and the, the angst that goes along with trying to get into medical school. And then you know, oncologists, they have a plan. You know, they, they say, well, follow the stress response, you know, engage in self-reflection, prioritize your basic needs. They, they, they bring this plan to the patients as well as to themselves because of, you know, again, unfortunately, because of the depressing nature of their, of their work, but also, again, you know, they, they reach out to others to, to find a way to get into things. So, again, we, we may be talking about burnout too much, maybe leading to more burnout. Who knows? Let's put up that first one of mine. I've got a, a few quick slides, just kind of what's new. Yeah, I guess when you think what's the opposite of burnout, I guess it's probably taking joy in what you do. <laughs> you know, this, this stuff is really not, uh, it's not joy. It's basically uh, it's where you feel like you just drag yourself through the day and, and to work and you go home and you don't really feel it. you're excited to get home. You, you feel like, oh no, you just feel really exhausted. 
So is there anything new about it? Um, are we getting burnout fatigue? Uh, so, you know, there is something new. Uh, there was actually an act that passed, uh, Dr. Lorna Breen Act. She committed suicide uh, from stress and dealing with her COVID-19 patients. And so Congress, uh, you know, they, they kept hearing 50% of physicians are burned out and all this, that, and the other. Um, they decided to uh, get some grant funding available for this. So uh, it's not like, I don't know if this is going to go directly to to us quickly, but it is something that's grants to organizations, institutions, et cetera, to kind of help address this issue. And I don't know how quickly that's going to produce results, but at least there's something out there. And so uh, theoretically, uh, we could apply for something like this. Um, I mentioned this to Rick Parkinson yesterday, and I think one of the reasons we're experiencing a lot of this stuff um, that Mark talks about and that we've, we've mentioned repeatedly um, is uh, this is sort of a, uh, an allegory, if you will. I remember I was at the Southern Medical Association meeting back in the 1990s. It was in Dallas years ago. It's, it's basically the Southern uh, AMA. And uh, they had a, a food court, like here, like we had a buffet, you know, in line, little small lines. You could walk, there, two of them. Well, this was sort of like food court, like at the mall. And uh, the idea was you would walk up and, and get your food. Well, this is a cafeteria style. So you see people are, are in line. And so that's the way people were... Uh, lining up. The doctors were lining up like that in, the, in this. So this is the way it was set up, but they were lining up like this. And so I went, you know, straight up to the, I wanted, I guess, some Italian food or whatever they were serving. I went straight to that line. And some guy behind me says, hey, you're cutting a line. I said, no, this isn't supposed to be a line. You're supposed to go directly up to the window. You know, it's more like going at the bank where you're going to one window after another. And uh, I said, you know, that's, we're like sheep like that. We are like sheep. And that's exactly why we are treated that way. We haven't asked for a raise in 20 some odd years. You know, when I was president of AD, it used to irk the heck out of me that, you know, every year they were trying to cut us. I said, this whole thing is, is screwy. And we're just kind of allowing them to do it. We actually thought that was a win. We need to be more like these commandos here. Uh, we ha we're going to have to do that. And there's more and more of, of these younger generation millennial doctors and Generation X doctors now that are, that are coming into this. They've, had, they've not experienced medicine without burnout. And they're kind of getting sick of it. They're saying, I've got this debt. I spent all these years. Now I'm ready to practice. I've got all these negative things on me. I've never trained in business-related stuff. They, they, they're feeling angry now. And they're beginning to say, we need to unionize. And all of us sheep doctors for years said, oh, no, no, we can't do that. You know, we're, we're healers. You know, we're healers. And the, the uh, politicians know that, that we're healers, and they know we're not fighters. And they treat us more like sheep th than people that are standing up for their rights. And so we're going to have to shift the paradigm. And I don't know if it's unionizing or not, but unless we're going to do that, we're going to continue to be treated like sheep. That, that red graph is going to stay low. It's not going to start going up like the hospitals and the nursing homes. And you want to talk about fraud in medicine. Nursing homes is, is one of the top places for medical fraud in there. So anyway, that's, that's a problem. Um, no new actions have yet, I think, been taken, but I'm a, I can talk a little bit about this. But if you ever get a complaint lodged about you, you're guilty until proven innocent. And every complaint that gets lodged at the Texas State Board of Medical or your state board, they have to open a file on you and do it. So some crazy person can be upset about a bill. They can, they can be crazy, literally. They have to open it up and investigate you. And it usually takes, you know, quite a while to, to get over that. And that's stressful. They, they, give you, they send you a notice. You have to produce information uh, in a short period of time. Um, you know, they have different standards of things that we have, that standards that you should have known things were going on. We talked about that in the FDA, uh, the, the session yesterday that Neil talked about. Uh, there's a friend of mine that actually did get attacked. He had a, a, a criminal guy working in his, as his clinical trials. They came in and said, well, you should have known this guy was doing that, yeah. you know. Uh, so they, they, they don't have it. And it's, that should have known comes from law. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. <laughs> Uh, so if you settle because you don't want to fight, you know, they, these regulators will issue a press release about their victory. They won, you know. Well, they didn't really win. We're not taught to deal with these issues. We really need some kind of legal advocacy group to fight for our rights. And, and I, I mean, I, I wish I had more time, <laughs> but that's, that would be a project that would really kind of uh, 
interesting to do because we really need something that can, can help us to deal with this stuff. We, we are sheep. We're not trained to be fighters. How many hats can we wear? <laughs> you know, our head is only so big. So, you know, is burnout getting better or worse? Uh, well, according to the, the data, it may be, it's gone from over 50% to now slightly below 49%. Well, that's not great. That's still high compared to other workers. It's, you know, 28% for others. So we're still up there. Uh, it's, it's still increasing in some settings, however, in managers and employees. It's not going down for everybody. But uh, the 45%, it's maybe a slightly uh, an indicator that maybe it's kind of getting a little better. Um, is there any reason it might be getting better? Well, health organizations are adapting to, to these things now. They're beginning. Some organizations are actually implementing things. So if you work in a, in a big institution like Mayo Clinic or something like that, they understand this is an issue now. And they're beginning to try to do things to help deal with physician wellness. Um, a lot of these burned out physicians have left the workforce, reduced clinical hours. Maybe that's one reason it's getting better. Uh, so, but we can't just assume it's going to continue to get better because still 45% is, is still pretty high. Um, so basically, empowerment um, around some kind of cause, this kind of goes back to the, um, the article that, uh, that Mark showed, and, and that's what they're kind of recommending in those articles, that, that we need to kind of, this, this was a, this BA, this was a medical student, and he said, we need to organize. So he's one of these millennial doctors that, that's just, you know, getting ready to become into the workforce. And he wrote this, this article that got picked up by the press. And he's saying doctors need to expand their focus from addressing social determinants one patient at a time and band together. So there's a lot of these, these younger people say, we need to, to unionize. And, uh, you know, maybe we need to. We're going to have to do something. And, uh, you know, these e EHR programs are still serious. That death by a thousand clicks, I mean, that is still a very uh, serious, big issue. Um, so, you know, success stories. We'll keep active, keep working, focus on the positive. This is, a, this is an article that was in one of our throwaways not too long ago. This, this was a 100-year-old doctor <laughs> uh, that's still going into work. And, uh, you know, and the Japanese have this concept. They call it ikigai. And it's basically the reason for being, having a sense of purpose. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that Jiro Dreams of Sushi. I think the guy's like 90-something years old. He still goes down to the, uh, to the subway where his four star, Michelin three-star sushi bar that seats 10 people, uh, he does that every single day. He's got a 70-year-old son that's just now learning to <laughs> have his own restaurant. Um, and in, the, in Japan, there is no word for retirement. It doesn't exist. So they don't know the concept of retirement. They treat old people there like treasures, uh, if you will. So this is an interesting little book um, about the Japanese secret to a long and happy life. Uh, so in spite of all this negative stuff that we're fed constantly, uh, you have to realize that you're a contribution. Our society doesn't value old people like Japan. I may decide to move there when I retire. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll probably be that old when I retire. But, but anyway, they, uh, they don't value people here. They throw you to the pasture. You know, when you're finished being president, you're gone, man. They don't, they don't want you at the AAD anymore. So uh, uh, that's basically, uh, uh, they don't do that in Japan. And, and this is what the, the Jap, they let this, uh, in, the, in that book, they talk about these are the little, uh, you know, uh, intersecting circles here. Uh, of all these various things that if you have all these in balance, that's, that's your, you know, central core there, your icky guy. It's kind of an interesting thing. And Mark mentioned resilience. Yeah, we have to have that. In the old Japanese proverb, they say, fall seven times, rise eight. Uh, resilient people know how to stay focused on their objectives. Uh, they don't give in to discouragement. Uh, their flexibility is the source of their strength. And, and I think a lot of us have this. Um, I would say that, that in my own personal situation I had to deal with for six plus years, uh, this kept me literally alive. <laughs> so you, you have to have resilience and you have to have, and, and in order to get resilience, you have to, to kind of do these little things. You know, you have to be grateful. You have to have, you have to savor things. Like you have to look at these mountains and, and let that stuff kind of come in. Um, you have to be mindful, you know, meditate, you get touch. Touch is very important. You have to have, you know, uh, that actually causes serotonin levels to rise. So you have to have some physical thing. Not, not necessarily sex, but you have to have, a, you know, touching is, is an important uh, thing for people's lives. So all those things are resilience practices that you sort of have to do when you're dealing with a severe, stressful situation that you're in. And we're all basically in stressful situations. Uh, the context of anti-fragility, 
the concept of getting stronger after harm, uh, creating redundancies, and this is Hercules cutting off the head of the hydra, and we cut off one, and, and new heads would sprout, and so he had to learn how to deal with that. Uh, it's kind of a metaphor for, for being non-fragile, so you have to basically learn how to be strong in the setting of, of a lot of these things, and, and get rid of the things that make you fragile. So there is still a serious problem. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think that basically, uh, you know, we, we can work on this. I really think, though, we're going to need to do something a little bit more formal. Um, I, the AAD is, is, you know, we all think, well, we're the academy and it's a big deal, but compared to all of organized medicine, it's, a, it's a still a pretty small deal. And uh, we really need to get uh, the entirety, more of organized medicine together with this, realize it's a problem, and we need to do something probably as a medical organization. Uh, because our enemies are not each other. Uh, it's not uh, the plastic surgeons or something else. It's really people in Congress, like Mark was saying, till they realize, until they feel the pain of voters saying, we're tired of you treating our doctors like garbage. Um, and, you know, Medicare patients like their doctor. Now, they may not like the healthcare system, but they do like their doctor. And so we're going to need to let our patients know at some point that, you know, uh, we may not be able to take Medicare in the future. You know, uh, Congress made it really not uh, worth us to do it anymore. And uh, when they start losing access, that's when they're going to start losing votes. So yeah. let's open it up. We've got uh, about five minutes. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'll have time for this, but we'll see. Yes, it is. Funny to say about touch too. I mean, we in residency you tell everyone you got to touch your patient at least once to make a connection. To oh, for sure. Put your hands on them at least one time, even if it's just shaking hands. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is this coming through? Yeah, yeah. it is. It is. Um, I I think it might be helpful to remind um, everyone here that politicians are never going to feel sorry for dermatologists. They're not going to pity us. They're not going to act on our behalf because we're not making enough money. <clears throat> so if you want to have some action, you'll have to do it. And you'll have to be forceful about it. Money talks. That's the name of the game in Washington. I've spent much of my professional life in politics. And I want to stress how important it is to take strong effort to defend our, our interests. Um, with one anecdote, if I may. Some years ago, at one of these meetings, um, the head of our um, society, uh, our organization, said, I've got some good news and some bad news. Maintenance of certification is going to be used by medical licensing boards across the United States, and if you don't keep your board certification, you can lose your license. Were you aware of this? Show me by hands. Did you know this was happening? Yeah. <clears throat> so I heard that, and I went up and talked to our president and said, I want a clarification. Are you saying that people who aren't board certified or who may fail an exam are going to lose their licenses? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Big movement. So I called Clay Cockrell, and I asked him, what, what would you do? And he said, I'd go to the top government official in your state, tell him you don't want it. So I went to see the governor. I went to see a dozen legislators that I know very well. I explained the situation to them. They said, no way. We're not going to have Doppel, our Department of Licensure in the state of Utah, ever do that. And Utah was the first state in the nation to pass a law that said board certification or any sort of certification will never, ever be a requirement for licensure in the state of Utah. 100% support. There was not one negative vote in the House or the Senate. One person can make a difference. Our organization, yeah, it can make a difference, but you can too. Thanks, that's, that's really true. And, uh, you know, Rick was very uh, instrumental in helping to get reimbursement for SRT in the state of Utah. There were people there that were saying that they didn't think dermatologists should be allowed to treat their patients with SRT, so he actually came and testified and was very powerful. Um, this is a little longer than three to four minutes. I, don't know if we, I think maybe have some more discussion, and then maybe I'll do this later if we have time.
Mark, it's so refreshing to hear that you're recognizing that we have a problem with reimbursement and that we have been ignoring that. When I first became in practice, I just assumed that the American Medical Society, AMA, would be supporting us and that they would be looking at financial issues, and that has been completely ignored. And I'm still incredulous about that. So I think for us to continue doing what we're doing, we have to become active. We have to recognize that. And I, I'm just so refreshed to hear that you're recognizing that, and I hope that, that we will continue to do that, because you know the cuts that you showed us are just amazing. And there is money out there. Um, nursing homes and hospitals are seeing their curve go up. And so um, we need to you know, do what they're doing so we can also see our curve improve. Thank you for that. I think it's really important to stress that. And, and the other thing I would tell you is, as long as I'm president, it will be our number one priority. I'm not gonna be president for, in 10 months I won't be president anymore. What, what I need all of you to do, and all of your colleagues to do, is, is to write an email to president at aad.org. It sounds like it comes to me, but it actually goes to the executive office of the academy. And tell them that uh, understanding what's going on with reimbursement changes at the end of this year, I, I would like the academy to focus on this as their primary focus. Okay, because I can tell you now being president of a large organization, we have over 20,000 members worldwide, is that there are a lot of, there's a, a, everyone's got an agenda, right? There are a lot of people that want to do a lot of different things, but there's a few of us who understand that if we can't fix this problem, it doesn't matter what you want to do, you're not going to be able to do any of those things. And there has to be priorities, so please send that message because a lot of times the people who are interested in certain issues are very vocal, but some of us who are working really hard, we're not. And we don't hear necessarily from the folks in the trenches as much that are too busy working to worry about other things that become priorities for an organization. So I'm not saying that they're not important and that we won't pay attention to them, we will, but I'd, I'd like for the Academy to remain focused as this is their number one priority. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I would say another way to at least help is, is give to Skin Pack. Um, you know, Rick talked about the fact that some of these other organizations like trial lawyers, I mean, they, just, they generate way more than we do. And, uh, you know, we really need to contribute to that as much as we can. And I, I would like to see that actually be kind of put on a, you know, rocket Fuel. It just it seems to me like that the way that is functioning is not as effective as it could be. Uh, it really needs to be run like a, a business, if you ask me, and it's really sort of still run more like a mom and pop sort of thing. Yeah, but we I'm, it, it, we are. I mean, every year we're doing better with Skin Pack than the year before, um, but we still need everyone to participate. And it doesn't. You don't have to give five thousand dollars to Skin Pack. Any amount would. Uh, would be great. If, if every dermatologist in this country gave one skin biopsy a year to skin pack, we would have more money in our pack than we do now. It doesn't take much. There are a lot of us. So even if you don't feel like you can you know, donate the maximum of $5,000, even if it's $500, do it. Because it doesn't buy votes, but it buys access. We get meetings with folks because we are able to support them. And that's really important. So I would echo that. Great. Well, thank you guys for your uh, attention and for listening. Oh, Jackie, one final comment. I totally then, uh, agree about like being militia instead of sheep, and the optics of it that we're doing so for the patients, right? You know, and, for, and we're doing it for our staff because you know when they have these diversity clauses and things like that. I negotiate with United, and I'm like, I'm a woman-owned business, and I employ women, and I have women, of, you know. So, so I think the important thing is that we're really fighting to protect the patients, right? The optics versus like, oh, we need more money. You know, we are doing this because this access is for our patients. Absolutely, this is the best yeah. way we can take care of our patients and our staff.